Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History. As we begin this lesson today, I would like to turn to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter number three. And we all know the setting for this chapter. This was during the days of the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel and his three Hebrew friends were there in the kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar, being the king, he was supreme. The image that he made was representative of his kingdom and of himself, the king. And he wanted total allegiance, total allegiance of all his subjects. And so therefore he made this image. And in Daniel chapter three, verse one, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three, four cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Verse 2, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, governors, captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, rulers of the provinces, to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. This was a big deal. Then the princes, the governors, captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried out, to you it is commanded, it is commanded, not recommended, but it is commanded, O people, nations, languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, all kinds of music, fall down and worship the golden image. Fall down and worship the golden image set up by the secular king, king of Babylon. And whoso falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. This man wanted total devotion. And he was the head of a secular empire. Can you see any correlation today with the American empire? You better obey. If you don't fall down and worship, if you don't accept and believe the narrative of the state concerning any issue, and we just went through two or three years of one issue where the health of the people were at stake. I won't mention what it is or what it was. You know what it was. The health of everyone was at stake, but you better believe the narrative. You better bow down before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And whosoever falleth not down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, butt, psaltery, all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages fell down and worshiped the, the golden image. Most people fell down and worshiped the golden image. 
by far. But there were three that refused to bow down to the image of the state. We know who they are. Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, O king, these men have not regarded thee. They serve not thy God, nor worship the golden image. That was the report to the king. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, don't ever incur the rage and fury of the state. In rage and in fury, he brought these before him. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, Sack, but sultry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Oh, the fury of the state. There are people today, good people, Christian people, that are being tried, arrested, incarcerated because they refuse to bow down to the image of the state in different ways, in different areas in which they felt it was unjust. But one of the ways that men have found themselves at the fiery end of the wrath of the state is through the school system, not bowing down to the school system. And a father called me not too long ago, living in Pennsylvania. And he said, some woman, whoever this woman was, he said it was a Lutheran woman, turned him in because he was homeschooling his two girls. So here comes the squad cars. Well, how did this develop in our land? How did the public school become the standard for all education? How did the state that buys and pays for approved textbooks be put in every public school? How did this start? It didn't start big. It started really small. And it got bigger and bigger. Where the state, whether it be federal, state, or county, says we're going to teach transgender in the schools and parents whether you like it or not, we're going to teach it. How did the NEA get so powerful? They started small. But now they're a monster. And I've mentioned before 
that when a state or a government gets so big, they take on divine attributes, mainly indivisibility. You can't divide it. Number two, infallibility. And number three, irresistibility. You can't resist it. Here again, I would like to try to explain the best of my ability something that we're all aware of. We grew up with it. We participated in it as children, thinking it was the right and the patriotic thing to do. I remember going to a public school, especially in the grade school, Every day, the bell would ring, and every class, regardless of the, the grades, all stand up in the schoolroom and pledge allegiance to the flag. Pledge our allegiance to the flag of the United States. And how did this begin? Did school children of 1850, 1875, 1890, did they pledge, did they have a, a pledge to the flag? The answer is no. It began in 1892. And this is how it began. There was a man by the name of Francis Julius Bellamy. I'll just call him Francis Bellamy. Born in 1855 in Mount Morris, New York, and he died in 1931 in Tampa, Florida. He was a Christian socialist. Now, if you recall, the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx was written in 1848. Communism, the concepts of communism were quite prevalent in America in the 1850s because Karl Marx was still alive and he was writing articles and Horace Greeley of the, uh, of the New York Tribune was buying articles from Karl Marx, who lived in London in a, in a pigsty. And he would write articles. Horace Greeley would buy them and put them in the newspaper. And it was one of the most prominent papers in the, in the country at that time, even during the time of the, quote, Civil War the war for Southern independence. Abraham Lincoln was reading those articles written by that communist. But this man, Francis Bellamy, born in 1855, he was the son of a Baptist minister. And for some reason, this man turned out to be a socialist through probably reading and reading the newspapers and listening to the socialists of his day. But yet he was a, quote, Christian. So he called himself a Christian socialist. And when he entered the University of Rochester as a ministerial student, in 1872. For his graduation commencement speech, he spoke on, quote, the poetry of human brotherhood. And in this speech, he applauded the concepts of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And 
as I said before, he was a, a Baptist and he began his ministerial experience in 1880 in Little Falls, New York, and he became involved with the National Prohibition Party for the prohibition of slavery. And in 1885, he moved to accept the pastorate of the Dearborn Street Church in Boston. And he gave a speech, or one of his sermons was entitled, Jesus the Socialist. And this was just one of a list of sermons on the socialism of the primitive church. Now, he believed in what back then was called nationalism. I know that the meaning of that word has changed, but back then, nationalism meant they advocated the socialist utopian state. They were striving for a utopian state with political, social, economic equality for all. And it was determined and operated by the federal government. The federal government would determine what was fair culturally, socially, financially, for every citizen. That sounds very familiar with what we have today. It was a communist concept. In 1891, Bellamy was so liberal that his Baptist church forced him to resign. But in 1892 was the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus coming to the New World. And in October of 1892, there was going to be this big Christopher Columbus Day. And it was sponsored or it would be held at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, the World's Columbian Exposition. And this man who believed in the separation of church and state, but yet he was using the Bible for his argument to advocate socialism, believing that Jesus was a socialist. And there was a magazine published at that time, and it was called The Youth's Companion. And it was a magazine that was published, and they were advocating selling American flags to every school, every local school in the country. They wanted every schoolhouse to have an American flag, stars and stripes. So that was the big push. And so what Bellamy did with this magazine, he joined this magazine, he was hired as a PR person to promote the National Public School Celebration for Columbus Day in 1892. And one of his associates was the NEA, National Education Association. So they needed something that would be cohesive, that every school child could say or repeat. So Bellamy wrote a pledge to the flag. Now, 
As we all know, we've said this many times years ago, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Pledge my allegiance to the flag and to the republic. What does the word allegiance mean? It means loyalty, devotion, obligation, reverence. Am I going to pledge my allegiance to this United States empire, so-called republic? when it's not even truly a constitutional republic, when it's a socialist state, am I going to give my allegiance to the state? The state is not my God, and I hope it's not yours. But Bellamy's first pledge was, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, indivisible, just like I said before, indivisibility, with liberty and justice for all. That was his first pledge. The indivisible part, the reason he put that in there was the concept against Southern secession, where the Southern states seceded in 1860 and 61. In other words, this state cannot be divided. But a quick comment on that. When the 13 original colonies were formed, they were formed as independent, sovereign countries. They were sovereign and independent from one another. And they came together as a confederation. But yet they still had that sovereignty where they could pull out if they wanted to. And even when the Constitution was written, it gave limited powers to the federal government or the national government. And all other powers was reserved for the states. In other words, the state was sovereign. They could, in other words, secession was legal in 1861. It was legal. So therefore, that's why Bellamy put that in there. And then he says, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody, because he believed in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of all men. So it was a, it was the popular thing being promoted in the French Revolution. Well, the, later on in 1854, I believe it was, President Dwight David Eisenhower, he put into the, the pledge under God. I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the United States of America for which it stands, one nation under God. And I think he did that with the help of the Knights of Columbus. But anyway, he put it under there, put it in there to counteract this concept of encroaching atheism and communism in America. So the day came and this 
paper, the youth's companion, was mailed out all across the United States to educators, to schools, with this pledge in it. And they wanted people to start saying that to the facing the flag. And the first pledge was not said with your hand over your heart, but it was said with the outstretched right arm at a 45 degree angle. But in the 1930s, that was quickly changed, as you well know, because that was the salute of the Nazi party. So they, the authorities said, put your hand over your heart. Well, President Benjamin Harrison was there, and he gave some speech, you know, commemorating the 400th anniversary of the discovery of the New World. And that is the beginning of the mentality, the propaganda in the schoolhouses, in the minds of every school child, that we pledge allegiance to the state. Now, I have no problem with the American flag, the stars and the stripes. I have no problem. And in fact, when I was over in Moscow, Russia, several years ago, one of the most welcome sights, when I was riding down the street in Moscow, when I saw a U.S. Marine stand at attention with the American flag flying above his head, standing in front of the U.S. Embassy. I have no problem with the flag. And I can understand the reverence that people have for that flag. Many people died under that flag, thousands, tens of thousands. And I've officiated many a funeral for veterans. And there, the, in that chapel, was that flag-draped coffin. I can understand. But to pledge my allegiance to the state? They're used, they used the flag, which was that emblem, that visible emblem that people could see and speak with their mouth, I pledge my allegiance to the flag and to the republic. Can we say that in honesty today? Can you say that in honesty, that you're going to pledge your allegiance to this empire called the United States government? See, I love my country, but my government is gone astray. It's off the rails. There's a difference in my mind between country and government. Country is the land. It's the people, it's the work, it's the families, it's their faith, it's their everyday lives. It's, you know, their communication with one another, family and friends gathering together, and the liberty that we have. But my government is no longer the Constitutional Republic of the 18th century. 
So how can I pledge my allegiance, my loyalty, my devotion, my obligation and reverence to the state that has killed thousands overseas and here in the, our own domestic land that foments wars around the world, that finances the butchering and the murder and the mayhem of thousands of people and the corruption in government. I cannot pledge my allegiance to a government like that. A Christian should pledge his allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. And you might say, well, yes, but this is our country. Well, as I said, our country is different from our government. And I have no problem with the flag itself. Every one of us has a flag or an icon of some sort that stands for something. And I reverence our, our veterans. And I've been to several national cemeteries here in America and overseas. Normandy, Cambridge, I've been there and stood in awe of those grave markers, crosses, thousands of them, in a perfect row, thousands of them. And you get that special feeling of reverence for those who died under that flag. But many a soldier you can hear some of these old World War II soldiers that they're interviewing say, this is not what I fought for. That's the way this pledge started. It's propaganda. Do you know that this, this organization started by the Youth Companion publication and the organization that spawned off of that. In 1928, a conservative Baptist group with the Daughters of the American Revolution charged the forum that spawned off of that whole event with promoting anti-Christian, un-American, socialistic, and communistic ideas. And the forum was therefore denounced by the Boston Baptist Social Union. Francis Bellamy became a hero to John Dewey. American public education is what has been the tool of the state to mold the minds of Christians, young and old, from grade school through college, in socialistic ideas, in ideas that are anti-biblical. And see, Francis Bellamy believed in nationalization of everything. Let the state control everything. And deprivatize education. He said the state should educate your child. Let me read his statement. This is what 
Francis Bellamy wrote. We assemble, we assemble here that we too may exalt the free school that embodies the American principle of universal enlightenment and equality. The most characteristic product of our four centuries of American life. One institution more than any other has wrought out the achievements of the past and is today the most trusted for the future. Our fathers in their wisdom knew that the foundations of liberty, fraternity, and equality must be universal education. The free school, therefore, was conceived as the cornerstone of the republic. Washington and Jefferson recognized that the education of citizens is not the, pro the prerogative of church or other private interest. That while religious training belongs to the church, and while technical and higher culture may be given by private institutions, the training of citizens in the common knowledge and the common duties of citizenship belongs irrevocably to the state." Unquote. Clear enough. But the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This may seem and appear as though that's a very small thing. To come up with a pledge. But do you see, it was early on propaganda to elevate the state in the minds of the people. And not long after that, History tells us that there was another war, Spanish-American War, and the war hawks were really squawking because it gave them impetus. The state was behind them. We can go and we can invade Cuba. We can defeat Spain. And we can use the main, that ship, as a false flag, and then we can conquer the Philippines and Puerto Rico. The state became the almighty, powerful element in the minds of the people, and they acted it out in war. I know this has been somewhat different, but I pray that you get a glimpse of how a lot of propaganda has influenced the minds of the American people in politics, culture, and in church. And we have a magazine here called Truth and History. If you have never received a copy, we'll be glad to send it to you free of charge and put you on the subscription list for nothing. I pray that we have learned something today, been inspired to give our allegiance to none other than our Lord and our Savior, our Melchizedek priesthood, our prophet, our coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.